Good evening. I'm Ellie Meyerfeld, CEO here at the Holocaust Memorial Center, and I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's program, both those on Zoom, but especially those who are here in the museum. I'm delighted to welcome you for the first in-person event since early 2020. It's been a challenging time for each of us, but we at the museum have learned a lot over the last year and a half, finding new ways to implement our mission, even when we couldn't be in the same space as students or the public. This museum is now under some renovation so that we can expand our education department to apply what we've learned to provide more online opportunities, even as the in-person events and the visits resume. So please bear with us tonight if you notice any construction signs or oddly paced uh, furniture here, even in the auditorium. Um, and for those of you who are on Zoom, please visit us in person as soon as you're comfortable. Come see our new special exhibit, The Girl in the Diary, Searching for Rivka from the Lodge Ghetto, which runs through December. With thanks to our presenting event exhibit sponsors, Judy and Sam Jasanoff. The Holocaust Memorial Center is delighted to have the Sis Maisel Center for Judaic Studies and Community Engagement at Oakland University as our community partner on this event. A special welcome to Sis Maisel, to OU's president, Dr. Ora Hirsch-Peskovitz, and all of the Oakland University staff and alumni who are joining us this evening. Our condolences to Dr. Peskovitz on the loss of her father, Rabbi Richard Hirsch, who was a giant of a leader in the Jewish world. And now it is my honor to introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Derek Hastings is Associate Professor of History at Oakland University. He received his PhD in Modern European History from the University of Chicago. Derek's the author of two books, Catholicism and the Roots of Nazism and Nationalism in Modern Europe. And he is currently working on a new book about Ernst Röhm, the uh, founder of the SA in the Brown Shirts. Uh, we were discussing it's probably a dozen times that he's been a lecturer, frequent lecturer here at the HMC. And so it's really an honor. Please join me in welcoming back Dr. Derek Hastings. Thank you. Great. Well, it really is uh, an honor to be here. Um, uh, as was just mentioned, I've, I've been able to speak here. I've had the pl pleasure of speaking here on numerous occasions, and it's always been a, a wonderful experience, at least for me. As far as the audiences go, that's always a, a different question, but it's always been um, uh, one, of the, one of the highlights for me to be able to participate here. So I guess I have to ask at the outset, am I audible? Can you hear me well? Okay, great. I can shout, but I'd rather not. So we'll, uh, we'll leave it like this. Um, I am really uh, happy uh, to be here tonight to be able to talk through some of the historical context surrounding the excellent exhibit being hosted here, obviously on uh, Rivka Lipschitz, uh, who is the girl in the diary, or as the title here indicates, the girl lost, uh, and her diary, which, as many of you know, was discovered in the rubble of Auschwitz in uh, 1945. Um, but was written uh, when Rivka was living in the Lodz ghetto. And um, uh, obviously, um, the Polish pronunciation uh, would be Wudge. I think many of us are aware of that. It's much more common, obviously, in the US and in English speaking context to speak of it as the Lodz ghetto, and that's what we'll do this evening. Uh, but Rivka was 14 years old uh, when she wrote the diary. Um, she wrote it between, at least the portion that we have, uh, was written between October of 1943 and April of 1944. And uh, she took it with her um, when she was transported from uh, Lodz to Auschwitz. And it is there that it was discovered then upon liberation in 1945 by a Soviet um, military uh, doctor who then took it back with her to the Soviet Union where it essentially languished in obscurity uh, until the 1990s. Um, and so the exhibit does an outstanding job of tracing the discovery and then rediscovery and the analysis and transcription and translation of the diary itself. So I won't go into any significant detail here, um, but I'll also note that the exhibit does a tremendous job of tracing the fascinating and mysterious fate of Rivka herself, um, the girl lost. Um, uh, Rivka, it seems, survived Auschwitz um, and uh, was likely transported to Bergen-Belsen 
Um, but her, uh, the paper trail, the documentary paper trail for her disappears in 1945. Uh, a number of her surviving relatives believe that she died um, uh, of illness in Bergen-Belsen in 1945. Um, but there is good documentary evidence to, to demonstrate that that may not, in fact, be the case. And so she may have been so ill as to not have survived uh, in 1945, uh, but we don't know. And uh, in fact, the uncertainty surrounding uh, Rivka's personal fate uh, makes the tangible nature of the diary she left behind all the more um, interesting and poignant. So my main goal tonight will be to briefly explore uh, the place where Rivka wrote her diary, her hometown. Uh, of, of Lodge and then uh, the establishment of the Lodge Ghetto. Um, and uh, I'll say a few words about the nature of uh, life in the Lodge Ghetto um, uh, and then reflect for uh, a few minutes on the, uh, the broader themes uh, emphasized by Rivka uh, in her diary. So the opening image that we have here uh, is quite um, uh, well known. It's, it's entitled The Lodge Ghetto Bridge by Yitzhak Browner. Um, uh, Browner um, oftentimes went by the name of Vincent Browner um, in uh, tribute to Vincent van Gogh. Um, but he was a resident in the Lodge Ghetto in the early 1940s. Uh, he did this piece, most likely in 1942 or 1943. And then he was deported to Auschwitz and murdered there in 1944. Um, but this, uh, the, the bridge itself and then this image uh, remains one of the defining uh, iconic images uh, of the ghetto. So what I'd like to do is um, to begin by turning on the, uh, the pointer here so that I can actually flip through the, um, through the images. I'd like to begin um, uh, with historical background as a um, professional historian, or at least that's what I'm told. Um, I should begin um, uh, with a little bit of discussion so we understand the sense of place uh, in which uh, Rivka lived, in which she wrote the, um, uh, uh, the diary. And um, I won't uh, go too far into detail on the distant historical past, but the city itself has just a fascinating uh, history. And, um, and so by the time Rivka was born in Lodz in 1929, the city had been a major industrial center for several decades, um, uh, but it was a much different city uh, about a century earlier, a little bit more. Um, it began as a tiny village um, uh, and uh, in the early 19th century, uh, still only had uh, a population of about 200 uh, in the year 1800. And um, one minor point I'll make about the year 1800, and we'll re return to this issue later, um, is that it was under the control of the German state of Prussia at that point in time. This was short-lived um, uh, German control in the 1790s and early 1800s. And ultimately after the Congress of Vienna in 1815, Lodz uh, became part of what's known as Congress Poland, which was a newly reconstituted Polish rump state that was basically a satellite of the Russian Empire. And that was the, um, uh, uh, the dominant force, the Russian Empire, uh, uh, on po uh, Congress Poland for most of the 19th century. Um, uh, but the, um, uh, the Germans would again, of course, occupy the city of Lodz during World War I, and then more importantly for us tonight, again, during World War II. Uh, so the German presence um, never really goes away, uh, as we'll see, um, but, um, uh, but is an important part of the backstory here. Now, uh, in 1900, a century later, the population had grown to about 300,000. And by 1939, on the eve of the German invasion, the population was over 650,000. So this was a meteoric rise in um, population. This was not a, a backwater. Uh, this was not uh, the middle of nowhere. This was an incredibly highly developed uh, industrial uh, city. Now, the main driving force behind it was the textile industry. And what we see here are a couple of images um, uh, on the left-hand side, the, uh, the textile factory of Karl Scheibler. Scheibler was a German Protestant who had moved um, uh, to Lodz uh, in the uh, aftermath of the 1848 revolution and opened this factory in the 1850s, which then grew into a kind of textile empire. Uh, on the other side, we see here the textile factory of Israel uh, Poznansky, um, uh, who was a Jewish businessman, entrepreneur, philanthropist. He was born in the city of the town, actually, of Alexandrov, which is just west of, of, of Lodz, and, um, and, uh, and built his own uh, sort of textile empire there. And I emphasize the importance here of uh, the textile industry because one of the major things that structures the life of Rivka Lipschitz in the Lodz ghetto is her experience working in a linen and clothing factory. And so the textile industry is, is, is sort of all encompassing in many ways, responsible for much of the growth uh, of the city uh, in the 19th century. So the city was not just an industrial 
center. It was a multicultural industrial center. And this is also an important point to remember um, as part of the uh, background here. Um, there were four major uh, ethnic groups represented in Lodz, uh, Poles, uh, the Jews, the Germans, uh, and the Russians. And so um, you may notice, I don't know how visible it is, those in the front can notice, the, the, um, uh, the captions on the uh, postcard on the left are in Russian and then in Polish uh, and then in German. Um, uh, the inscription of the caption on the uh, image on the right is entirely um, in Russian. Um, this is a kind of indication of that multicultural, multilingual, uh, multilingual um, uh, identity uh, of, of Lodz. Um, I don't read Russian, in case anyone does read Russian. I'm told that the image on the right has a misattribution, actually calling the uh, textile mill a, uh, a paper mill. And, um, and I mention this because the Russian presence was always there, but it was very distant and, uh, and not very well-informed uh, presence. The Russian Empire was the dominant power politically over Congress Poland, and there was a small Russian population in the city, um, but they were the smallest of the, um, of the major ethnic groups. Uh, the Poles, uh, not surprisingly, were the largest uh, of the major, uh, major ethnic groups, uh, the Polish Catholics uh, uh, primarily. Um, but interestingly, the Poles did not become a, um, a majority in the city until the 1920s. Uh, as the result of outmigration of uh, some of the ethnic Russians and ethnic Germans living there after World War I. Um, the Jews were the second largest ethnic group uh, in Lodz. Uh, in fact, for most of the first part of the 20th century, they made up about a third of the population. In 1939, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the population was over 650,000. Um, some 230,000 of those were Jews. Uh, making up about 35% uh, of the population. And um, uh, the German portion of the population in the early 20th century was about 15%. It sunk to about 10% or so after World War I. Um, but German businessmen uh, had been drawn to the city um, uh, because of the textile industry throughout the 19th century. And um, the ethnic Germans living in and around Lodz were known as Volksdeutsche, ethnic Germans. They will play a bit of a, a, bit of a role uh, in a few minutes when we discuss the, um, uh, the German invasion. The point here is the linguistic, architectural, and uh, religious landscape uh, of Lodz was, um, uh, was deeply shaped by this uh, interplay between the various groups. Um, so if we talk specifically about Jewish life uh, in Lodz, which was incredibly rich, um, uh, uh, we could note at the outset that Lodz had the second largest Jewish population of any Polish city um, after Warsaw. Uh, and there were several major synagogues uh, in the city, two of which uh, served to, to really almost dominate the, um, uh, the civic landscape. Um, uh, but there were a number of other uh, smaller neighborhood synagogues, um, prayer houses, uh, study halls, uh, and so forth. So the first image that we have here and to the left is of the old town synagogue, the Stara uh, uh, Synagogue. Um, which was uh, 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 an Orthodox uh, synagogue that was founded initially in the early 19th century and then relocated to this spot on the Old Town Square in the 1860s. Um, it was originally an entirely um, uh, wooden building. Uh, here we see this imposing stone structure overlooking uh, one of the central commercial hubs of the, uh, of the Old Town, uh, um, giving an instance of its, uh, of its significance uh, to the fabric of life uh, in, in, in Lodge. Uh, we have on the right-hand side here um, what's known as the Great uh, Synagogue, which was built in the 1880s um, with uh, major financial support from Jewish communities in Germany. And, um, and so because of this, it was oftentimes known as the German Temple, not in a pejorative way at all, but its, uh, its design was almost identical to the uh, slightly more famous uh, Königsberg uh, uh, Synagogue in the German uh, East Prussian city of, of Königsberg, which is now the Russian city of Leningrad, parenthetically, but um, uh, the funding for the Great Synagogue um, uh, was also provided, at least in part, uh, by the German Protestant uh, uh, factory owner, Karl Scheidler, uh, who I mentioned before. And again, we get a sense not of perfect harmony between these different groups in, in, in Lodz, um, uh, but at least uh, mutual toleration and a good deal of mutual respect, at least through the, through the 19th century. Now, um, uh, both of these uh, synagogues and the other uh, major synagogues in uh, the city were destroyed by the Nazis in November of 1939, uh, just a couple of months after the occupation began. Um, very briefly, and we'll touch on this a little bit more, uh, 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 her faith, R Rivka's faith, was incredibly uh, important to, uh, to Rivka Lipschitz. Um, she came from a devoutly observant Orthodox family that had deep religious roots 
in the life, uh, in the religious life of, uh, of Lodge. In fact, uh, her father's brother, her uncle, Johannin Lipschitz, uh, was a rabbi, uh, and the father of Johannin's wife, so the father of her aunt, um, uh, whose name was Moshe Menachem Siegel, uh, was the um, head of the rabbinic court in uh, Lodge at the time of the German invasion. And so um, uh, the religious um, uh, component of, uh, of Rivka's diary is something that's inescapable. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so in terms of uh, 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 Jewish life in, in, in Lodge, um, just to paint the picture again of the, of the sort of hometown, the, the, the place that she comes from, um, uh, we can note that, that um, uh, there was a vast, uh, dense network of educational um, uh, institutions of uh, Jewish aid societies, uh, cultural organizations ranging from orchestras to lending libraries, and uh, an unusually large number of uh, Jewish sports clubs, uh, for, for what it's worth. Um, on, the, uh, on the left, we see a class picture from 1925 from a Jewish elementary school in Lodge. Um, and I'll note that educational life was, was, was bracketed off basically by uh, ethnicity and religion so that the Germans and the, and the Poles and the, and the uh, Jews and the, and the Russians uh, attended different schools uh, typically. Um, but one important aspect of educational life that, again, I'll touch on a bit later when we discuss Rivka's diary in more detail, um, is the presence of a movement known as Beis Yaakov, um, which was a, uh, a dynamic uh, religious education movement targeting um, uh, Orthodox girls. Um, and it, uh, this movement influenced uh, Rivka Lipschitz to um, uh, a degree that's hard to overestimate, uh, in fact. For what it's worth, the image on the right is uh, a 1926 photo of the cycling team from uh, uh, Lodge's branch, uh, branch of the uh, Bar Kokhba Sports Club. Um, uh, uh, part of the materials, uh, this, this photo comes from part of the materials that are held at Yad Vashem from uh, Lodge's most famous athlete, uh, whose name was uh, Moshe Kuckerman, uh, who was a world-class cyclist. He was the president of the Bar Kokhba Sports Club um, and the, um, uh, uh, generally a, 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 a sort of athletic luminary. Um, and I'll note that in 1939, again, on the eve of the German invasion, there were some 27 different Jewish sports clubs in Lodz, uh, from cycling to, to soccer, to chess, to boxing, uh, to gymnastics, uh, and so forth. Um, so to, to move more directly into the context uh, in which uh, Rivka's diary emerged, um, we should talk about the, um, uh, the formation uh, of the uh, Lodz ghetto uh, itself. Um, uh, which, of course, um, uh, begins, the story uh, begins with the German invasion in September of 1939. The Germans invaded Poland, as we know, on September 1st. They reached Lodz by September 6th. After a very brief battle known as the Battle of Lodz, uh, two days uh, in length, uh, the city fell on September 8th uh, of 1939. And almost immediately upon um, uh, the fighting uh, ending, uh, we had the ethnic Germans, the Volksdeutsche, uh, stepping forward in an attempt to um, exploit uh, German control uh, of the city, um, flying the swastika flags, uh, giving the Hitler salute. Um, we also have to note that uh, a fair number of anti-Semitic Poles also used the cover of German control uh, as an opportunity to, to carry out longstanding uh, racial uh, hatreds that they had harbored. Uh, against the Jewish community, uh, particularly in the late 1920s and throughout the 1930s, that kind of uh, tolerance or, or, or relative harmony or peace um, uh, between the different groups um, had frayed uh, considerably. And, um, and so um, uh, from the earliest stages of German uh, uh, occupation, the city's Jews faced widespread and open uh, harassment, uh, the destruction of property, the seizure of financial assets, and uh, banning from public spaces. And that persecutory regime um, was then um, mirrored by a remarkable project uh, for urban renewal. Um, we can see in the picture on the right, um, uh, a sign proclaiming the new name uh, of the city. No longer was it to be named Lodz, it was to be named uh, Litzmannstadt uh, in German. This was named for the German general that had led the German occupying forces um, that had occupied Lodz during World War I, Karl Litzmann. Uh, he had died a couple of years earlier, I believe in 1936, and so this was a way of honoring him. Um, and uh, uh, because of the German connections to Lodge in the past, it was targeted as a kind of um, um, uh, 
magnet for uh, urban renewal projects. And, uh, and so one of, the, one of the more stunning things that is taking place even as plans are being laid and, um, and the ghetto is being, uh, is being constructed um, uh, was a, a major um, a landscape, uh, uh, a sort of landscape architecture project. I guess we could say that if we can deal with stones and trees and things like that as having some sort of uh, architectural component. Um, this was in a um, uh, previously neglected area in the Erzhausen uh, district to the south of the city. The ghetto, as we're going to see, is going to be to the north of the city. Um, and um, uh, the banks of the, the Central River there were reinforced with large stones. They had a huge number of uh, amount of parkland was created, large number of trees were planted. Um, public bathing beach and a recreation area was created out of a lake-like basin uh, in the river. And uh, in the surrounding neighborhoods around that major project, uh, there, were, there were neighborhoods built with um, uh, street names uh, taken from German characters in Grimm's fairy tales to sort of make it this, this almost enchanted land of, uh, of wonder. Um, streets uh, uh, named for Cinderella, which in German is Aschenputtel. Um, uh, or Little Red Riding Hood, which is what Kepschen in German, or Rumpelstiltskin, or, or Hansel and Gretel, and so forth. Um, this was one project. There were a number of major projects throughout the city. Um, uh, uh, parts of the city were demolished and rebuilt. Avenues were widened. A new stadium was built uh, in part to host Nazi parades and, and, and Hitler youth rallies and so forth. And so this was a kind of gentrification on steroids uh, in a way. And I would like to note that the um, historian Gordon Horwitz has written an absolutely fascinating, deeply disturbing, but absolutely fascinating book about the de development of the city of Lodz uh, under uh, the Nazis uh, entitled Ghetto Stadt, Lodz and the Making of a Nazi City, which was published by Harvard University Press about a decade ago. Um, he begins his account uh, by discussing a, a massive newsreel footage team that shows up in 1941 uh, to document the triumphal progress of this transformation from uh, Lodge uh, into uh, Littmannstadt. Um, in any event, to the ghetto itself, um, although the persecution of the Jews began almost immediately upon the German invasion in September of 1939, it was not until the early months of 1940 that plans were set in motion to create what eventually became the Lodge uh, ghetto. And so um, on February 8th of 1940, uh, the Nazis announced that the city's Jews, who still at that point, despite out-migration, numbered over 175,000, that they would be moved into this tightly circumscribed area of the city to the north, which I realize may be a bit difficult for people in the back to see. Um, uh, it is the kind of yellowish area um, that is uh, surrounding a uh, very rundown uh, pre-existing neighborhood known as uh, Baruti in, uh, in, in uh, Lodge or Woods, um, this, this part of the city was, I mean, if we could call something a slum at that point in time, this, this, this was it. it the, the streets primarily were not paved. There was very little sanitation. There were no street lights. And so this was a jarring announcement for um, uh, the Jews of Lodge who had lived in um, uh, very comfortable parts of the city, had, had, had helped build um, uh, the civic in infrastructure of the city to be forced into this neglected, undeveloped, uh, and tightly circumscribed um, area of, of the city. So on May 1st of 1940, uh, after the enclosures were completed, the ghetto was proclaimed sealed. All contact between um, uh, Jews and non-Jews uh, was prohibited, uh, prohibited on, on penalty of death. And uh, the German military and reserve police units um, secured the perimeter, the outside of the ghetto, while the inside uh, was patrolled by um, uh, by Jewish uh, police forces um, uh, who uh, maintained order and oftentimes were, were quite brutal. And so the, uh, the Lodge ghetto was the earliest such ghetto uh, that the Nazis established, and it lasts the longest. It's the last to be liquidated, although it is, in fact, liquidated in the summer of 1944. Um, and one of the main reasons for that, that lengthy uh, existence, or that relatively lengthy existence, was the, the uh, productive capacity uh, that was maintained uh, throughout this period um, where um, uh, the forced labor of the uh, residents of, of, uh, of Lodge um, kept the, uh, the, the ghetto open and viable. Uh, the second image we have here uh, is of the Nazi administrator of the Lodge ghetto. Um, throughout the time uh, that, that Rivka is there, his name is Hans Bibo. Um, he was a very ambitious number cruncher. He was still young at the point in time he was appointed here. He was still in his 30s. 
Uh, he had begun his uh, career in, in the coffee import business, had basically no uh, expertise, but believed he knew people, he understood people, and more than anything, he understood productivity. And so um, uh, in May of 1940, he is uh, appointed the head of the Lodz, uh, Lodz Ghetto Administration, the Ghetto Verwaltung, as it was known. And uh, his goal was to demonstrate his managerial prowess by making the, um, the ghetto financially viable. And, um, and so this was to be done through the production of a variety of necessary products, uniforms, other clothing items, gloves, socks, um, also things like sheets and pillows and bedding. And I mentioned before how, um, uh, uh, how Rivka and, and many young residents in, in Lodz uh, were forced into the textile industry uh, to, tort, to sort of maintain the, the, the productivity. Um, so to, to enhance productivity, or at least enhance the chance of uh, productivity uh, being maintained, Bebo did um, recommend some direction of meager resources um, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of food supply and, uh, and medical provision for residents of the, of the ghetto. And we have to be careful here and emphasize meager. Okay, uh, Bebo was not a good guy. Bebo was a self-interested, I would use a different term uh, if I could, um, whose main goal was self-aggrandizement uh, through making the, uh, the, the, the ghetto uh, profitable. Um, so we're talking about uh, the goal of, of uh, providing the bare minimum necessary to allow for productivity. But because he, he went that far, um, he, uh, he clashed with a number of other Nazi officials. And so one of the ways of understanding, one of the ways that historians have understood the importance of, of, of Lodz uh, in the context of the broader debates that, that racked the Nazi uh, decision-making hierarchy uh, is to point to the division between uh, Bebo and his deputy, who was a guy named Alexander uh, Palfinger. Um, Palfinger believed that Bebo was coddling the Jews by providing anything and believed it was a hopeless endeavor to ever expect the ghetto to be financially viable. And, um, and so um, uh, the dispute between Bebo and Palfinger becomes emblematic of this broader debate within the Nazi hierarchy um, uh, between so-called productionists who like Bebo uh, wanted to make the, uh, uh, the ghettos financially viable and attritionists and ultimately exterminationists um, who like Palfinger uh, wanted to starve the ghetto of resources, uh, wanted to leave the residents of the ghetto there to die of disease or, or, or hunger. And if that took too long, then of course, to find some hopefully cost-effective method of mass execution uh, or extermination. And so um, important for Rivka's um, uh, context is that in the short term, Bebo and the productionists um, held the upper hand. Palfinger um, uh, was disgruntled and was forced to transfer after only six months. And Bebo continued on uh, through uh, over, over the next, uh, the ensuing years. Um, in the long haul, as we know, unfortunately, it was the attritionists and ultimately the exterminationists who held the upper hand. The, uh, the ghetto was able to survive until the summer of 1944, but uh, of course was liquidated uh, then. So uh, closer to uh, the life of, uh, of Rivka, which we'll be turning to in just a second. Um, uh, we'll discuss the internal um, administration of the ghetto. And um, as many of you are aware, the Nazis' main uh, method of internal administration in the ghettos was to appoint what were known as Jewish councils. Uh, the Jew term for Jewish council is Judenrat, uh, which usually consisted of pillars of the pre-war community who were forced into this very difficult um, circumstance of serving as a sort of bureaucratic liaison between the Nazi authorities and the ghetto population. And um, in most Nazi-run ghettos, um, the Jewish councils remained intact, at least for a substantial portion of the life of the ghetto, to serve as that kind of bureaucratic liaison. Unlike other places, inside of Lodz, the, um, uh, the Jewish council was marginalized very quickly. In fact, a number of the um, members of the Jewish council were actually killed uh, by the Nazis. And by the time the, um, uh, the ghetto opened in, uh, in May of 1940, um, the only uh, member left uh, was the figure on the left we see here talking to um, Hans Bebo, um, Chaim Rumkowski. Um, back in October of 1939, Rumkowski had been tapped as the head of the Jewish council, as the head of the Judenrat. Um, but as I mentioned, the, um, the marginalization of the rest of the, uh, or elimination of the rest of the Judenrat left Rumkowski in virtual dictatorial control 
of the uh, ghetto starting in, uh, in 1940. And uh, to say the least, Rumkowski, as most of you know, or many of you know, um, is an extremely controversial uh, figure. Um, he was almost universally reviled uh, as egotistical and power hungry. Um, he carried out and enforced many of the Nazis' policies with brutal uh, and ruthless efficiency. Uh, he presided over an often brutal uh, Jewish police force within the ghetto. In fact, he was so hated, as many may know, uh, he was so hated by the residents of, uh, of Lodge that uh, even after the, uh, the dissolution of the ghetto and Rumkowski's own transfer uh, to Auschwitz in the summer of 1944, uh, he was killed there, not by the Nazis, uh, but uh, most likely by uh, enraged uh, former residents uh, of Lodge. And, um, and so there's been some scholarly debate about whether the, the, the Lodge Jews who had been transferred to Auschwitz were actually the ones who killed Romkowski or whether they talked the uh, pre-existing uh, Jewish Zonderkommando uh, in Auschwitz, uh, it, whether they talked the Zonderkommando into uh, killing Romkowski for them. But in either, in either case, Romkowski seems to have met his end at, at, in an act of revenge, basically, for the brutal dictatorial behavior um, in, in Lodge. So, um, uh, Rumkowski and, and Bebo are, are, uh, are talking there. Um, uh, throughout the life of the ghetto, uh, they, they um, uh, served as a kind of unhappy partnership. We can't make this into any kind of a happy um, uh, uh, meeting of the minds. Um, Rumkowski uh, was in a very difficult position, and the Nazis were clearly the ones in the driver's seat. But Rumkowski's kind of desire for ruthless efficiency and productivity um, uh, dovetailed well with, uh, with Bebo's uh, goal of making the uh, ghetto financially productive. And so uh, the image on the right under the, uh, the caption Salvation Through Labor uh, is of a, uh, a saddle factory, a factory making um, saddles and saddle parts. You can note the, um, the young age of many of the people in that, in that photo. Um, uh, and uh, and, and uh, the order of the day, the dominant um, uh, overarching objectives of the ghetto during um, uh, during Rivka's time there uh, were labor and productivity, even though working conditions were often um, uh, horrific and nutrition and medical care were often uh, severely lacking. So importantly, to, you know, important to understanding um, life uh, in, the, in the ghetto, um, we have to mention, not really in the defense of, uh, of Rumkowski, but as a way of understanding the context better, um, that uh, he also presided over many attempts to try to maintain um, humanity in the face of this terrible and dehumanization uh, process. Um, one of his most important initiatives was the founding of what's known as the House of Culture in Lodz, uh, which held concerts and theatrical productions and did a lot to try to um, hold up the morale of, uh, of residents. Um, the image that we see on the left is the Lodge Ghetto Orchestra. The image on the right is of, the, is of a children's choir. Um, there was also a very active theater group that in the years 1940 and 41 um, held some 85 different performances. Um, and so this was a very important um, uh, and not to be underestimated uh, achievement, we could say, of Romkowski. But unfortunately, even the House of Culture fell victim to the regime of productivity. Um, in the summer of 1942, it was closed, and uh, the building that housed it was transformed into a factory that made pillows and blankets. Now, of course, throughout the entire time that, that Rivka was, was in um, uh, uh, the ghetto, the looming threat, uh, uh, the kind of ever-present threat, was, was that of deportation. Um, the deportations from the Lich ghetto uh, to the Kelmno extermination plant, that's known as, um, uh, as Kumhof, in German, but the Kelno extermination camp, uh, which was about 30 miles north of, uh, of, of Woods or, or Lodge, um, those deportations began in December of 1941 and were an ever present um, uh, 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 sort of looming threat uh, over the ensuing uh, years. And um, quite famously, uh, as the image on the left uh, indicates, in September of 1942, there was the most horrific and infamous wave of deportations um, that began with the announcement that we can see there uh, in German of uh, an Allgemeine Gehsperre, which uh, means a general curfew. This was a strict curfew that confined the residents to their houses so that um, uh, it would allow for the identification and orderly uh, roundup of uh, more than 20,000 
um, young and elderly people who were deemed uh, unworthy uh, of continuing to live because of their lack of ability to, uh, to work. And, uh, and so this uh, Algamane Geishpera was sort of transformed uh, into the term Shpera, um, uh, which was used to describe not just the curfew, but the devastating uh, uh, deportation that accompanied and followed uh, the curfew between September 5th and, and September 12th of, of, of 1942. Um, the image on the, on the right that we have up there um, refers to um, Romkowski's infamous uh, speech given right after the announcement of the Shpera um, on September 4th of 1942, known as the, um, uh, the Give Me Your Children uh, speech. Um, uh, uh, Romkowski essentially pleaded with parents to give up their kids as the only way of continuing to protect the ghetto's, uh, the ghetto's existence. Um, uh, he stated, quote, I never imagined I would be forced to deliver this sacrifice to the altar with my own hands. In my old age, I must stretch out my hands and beg brothers and sisters, uh, hand them over to me, fathers and mothers, give me your children. And um, this of course has become probably the biggest black mark against, um, uh, against Rumkowski. Um, but more importantly, two of the approximately 13,000 children under the age of 10 uh, who were deported um, uh, were Rivka Lipschitz's uh, brother, uh, Abramik, who was 10, uh, and her sister, uh, Tamarcia, or, or Tamara, uh, who was five. And um, uh, they were deported to their deaths in, in Kelmno. Um, this is something that, that, that Rivka could never get over. Um, and the, the, the loss, the devastation over the fate of her brother and sister, um, uh, that, that, is, that, that sense of guilt is one of the central themes in her, um, in her diary. Um, the final liquidation uh, of the ghetto takes place in August of 1944. I'm going to begin to, to, to turn to Rivka uh, for the next few, few minutes very quickly. Um, uh, the announcement was on August 3rd. Uh, 5,000 per day were to be transferred out. Uh, the German announcement on the left um, uh, says that the, um, that the camp is being verlagert, uh, which simply means being transferred uh, or transported. Um, it means being liquidated through transfer to, in this case, Auschwitz. Um, and so those transported to Auschwitz in August of 1944 included um, uh, Rivka uh, Lifshitz, uh, her sister, uh, Chipka, who we'll talk about in just a second, uh, and um, uh, Chaim Romkowski, uh, of course, who met his death upon arrival in Auschwitz um, at the hands of, of enraged former uh, residents of, of the, 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 the large ghetto, as we mentioned before. So one last note on Romkowski, and then the last couple of minutes here, we'll, we'll be dealing explicitly with, uh, with Rivka and her diary. Um, there's no way to excuse Romkowski's um, brutal uh, behavior, but it is important to note uh, that had certain things gone differently, the interpretation of Romkowski would be different. Um, for example, if the Soviet Red Army had continued its push in 1945 westward, and had they reached uh, uh, Wuj or Laj um, uh, uh, in the summer of, uh, of 1944 before um, the liquidation in August, um, the interpretation of Romkowski would be quite different. They would have, that would have been the only ghetto to have been liberated. Um, uh, and Romkowski's um, productionist regime would likely at least have been one of the plausible reasons why the ghetto lasted as long as it did. As it turns out, uh, the Red Army did not reach uh, Ludge in the summer of 1944. The ghetto was, to, uh, 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 um, was liquidated. So um, uh, importantly here, and I've saved this for last because I really don't want to step on the material that, that, the, um, uh, that the exhibit uh, communicates. It is such wonderful and riveting and exciting material, but there are, there are uh, certain things, certain themes that I really want to emphasize um, about the diary here for just a minute um, uh, that illuminate uh, very importantly, an adolescence uh, experience of life in this context that we've been discussing in the Lodge uh, Ghetto. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, Rivka was born in Lodge uh, uh, in 1929. On September 15th of 1929, this means that uh, she had just turned 10 when the Germans invaded uh, in September of 1939. She spent the very formative years of age uh, 10 uh, through uh, uh, 14 in the um, uh, 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 in the in the ghetto um, at age uh, 15 was was then um, uh, deported. I'm sorry, at age 16, so to age 10 to 15, and then age 16 was deported to to, to Auschwitz. 
Um, she wrote her diary between October of 1943, um, at least the part that we have, and uh, April of 1944 and took it with her. Um, it consists of over 100 handwritten pages, as you can see here, um, very tightly packed writing, top of the page to the bottom of the page, no margins on either side. Um, and um, uh, it's interesting to note that um, her formal education had ended when she was 10. Um, I mean, I barely knew how to spell my name when I was 10, okay? She, her formal education ended at age 10 when the Germans invaded. And so there are some understandable grammatical and organizational problems with the writing uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the diary. Um, however, uh, her deep intelligence and insight comes through on almost every page um, in a way that's, um, that, that's really remarkable. And her, her perspective as an adolescent girl provides a very important uh, perspective. So I'm going to explore just for just a, a couple of the, the central themes raised in her diary. And uh, I'm not going to go into a tremendous amount of detail because in addition to the exhibit, I'd like to point you toward um, uh, Rivka's diary itself. Um, I would encourage you to obtain and read uh, Rivka's diary. Um, uh, it was translated into English by Malgozada uh, Markov, it was edited by Anita Friedman, and published in English as Rivka's diary. Uh, with a very long subtitle, The Writings of a Jewish Girl from the Lodge Ghetto, founded Auschwitz in 1945 and published 70 years uh, later. It was published by HarperCollins in 2015. Um, the, in this volume, the diary itself is also accompanied by a series of excellent essays um, that discuss the, uh, the context uh, uh, of the, the fate of the diary after the Holocaust, the lives of Rivka's family, uh, surviving family members, uh, and so forth. Um, so one of the central uh, uh, overarching themes, not surprisingly, in Rivka's diary is her family. And we see on the left her registration card, which lists her parents. Um, we don't have any photos of Rivka uh, uh, or of her parents. Um, we're forced to deal with sort of a documentary paper trail, again, much of which is documented in the, uh, in the exhibit. And um, I want to start it by just making an obvious point here. Um, the Holocaust did not just kill individuals. It obliterated families, and families are more than just the aggregate sum of individual family members, okay? Families are uh, entities, are beings in their own right. They're really intricate organisms with their own traditions, their own memories, right? Their own, their own identities. And so the destruction of families um, adds an extra layer of victimhood. Um, the death toll, if we view it this way, is, is larger, of course, than simply the sum total of individual uh, victims. And so within Rivka's family, her father, Yanko, had died uh, in June of 1941. Um, her mother, Miriam, died in July of 1942. Both of them died of uh, illnesses related primarily to malnutrition and lung problems. Um, numerous passages in Rivka's diary um, uh, focus on her longing for her departed uh, parents. Uh, she offers a kind of dreamlike reflection on her parents in an entry from, July, uh, from January of 1944. Um, quote, Daddy, he appeared in front of me as if he were alive. I can see his eyes, his wise and expressive eyes, and I suddenly remembered his handshake. I still feel it. Oh, how much that handshake meant to me, how much fatherly love it had. Oh God, I will never forget it. My daddy, alive, my loving daddy, the dearest of all the dearest creatures uh, in the world. And she continues this kind of dreamlike sequence by um, uh, talking about her mother. She says, quote, then I noticed that my mom understood me. Mommy, I did feel it. At that moment in her dream, we got closer and we were living not like mother and daughter, but like best friends. But then the, the, the vision evaporates and she says, you know, then um, uh, uh, she says, oh God, excuse me, uh, then mom was dead. And what she hadn't told me remained a secret uh, forever. And this sense of longing is, 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 is not surprising. But the way in which Rivka reflects on that sense of longing is deeply insightful and, 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 and very eloquent. Uh, following the death of her mother, which again was July of 1942, uh, Rivka and her three siblings, Abramic, who was 10, Chipka, who was nine, and, and uh, Tamarzia, who's also known as Tamara, who was five. Uh, they were adopted by the family of their cousins. We see here in the image on the right, um, uh, two of, uh, of Rivka's cousins uh, who survived. 
um, and, uh, and as far as, as I'm aware, are still alive um, uh, in, uh, in Israel. On the left, we see uh, her cousin Minna, who in the diary is known as Minia, who was born in 1926. She's on the left. Uh, and on the right, we have her cousin Esther, or Astutia, uh, in the diary, who was born in 1923. So um, uh, Rivka took primary responsibility for the raising of her three younger siblings. And when Abramek and Tamarzia were deported tragically in the September 1942 Shvera that I mentioned uh, earlier, um, Rivka feels this crushing guilt. Her sister Chipka wasn't uh, deported. She was younger than uh, Abramek by a year, um, but she, didn't, she looked healthier. And Abramek looked very poor uh, and very unhealthy on the day of the selection. And uh, Rivka never forgave herself for not, for not attempting to spruce him up somehow or another to prevent um, his, uh, his deportation. Um, and so the loss of her siblings is another in incredibly powerful theme. In a, in a discussion in January of 1944 that she recounts, uh, in which a friend raised the issue of the Shvera, uh, Rivka becomes physically ill. She says, quote, that conversation, the whole thing upset me. I didn't feel well. I have no strength. My heart has become a heavy stone. I'm choking, choking. In another uh, sort of vision, she says, on Saturday morning, I had a dream. Suddenly the door opened and Abramic came in and then Tamara and mommy. I pounced on them. I caught Tamara's hand. I noticed Tamara was a, a little taller, but she looked the same, the same, we saw, uh, the same way we saw her last time. Abramic was decently dressed, something she blamed herself for not ensuring in reality. And he was taller too. But then I woke up. And importantly, she notes that the pain of these dreamlike reflections was too, uh, too intense uh, for her to bear for very long. And in a, in a remarkable passage, she says, quote, sometimes when I think at night, looking at what's far away, I feel like my heart is being squeezed and I feel such sorrow. I think about Tamarcia Tam Tam and Abramic, uh, where the cruel fate took them. I want to have them back so much like a flower covered with fresh dew. When I have dreams, sweet dreams, I see everybody next to me. I send them sweet smiles. I plan their future. But then suddenly, a thread of the sweet, silent dream is broken. And then I feel so sorry. My heart hurts, full of feeling. And rather than reading more quotes, I'll simply note that in these passages and in, and in several others, um, Rivka offers really an insightful reflection on the tragic paradox of memory. On the one hand, the irrepressible desire to commemorate and commune with lost loved ones. But on the other hand, the imperative of self-preservation, which requires the banishment of such memories because of the unbearable, uh, unbearable pain uh, they evoke. Rivka reflects on adolescent life. I'll move quickly here. She reveals common adolescent concerns in her diary, frustrations over still being considered a child, tensions with her cousins, anger over suspicions of gossip among her friends, jealousies over attention given to others. She also uh, records the mundane activities of everyday life in the ghetto, commenting on the rhythms of work in the clothing and linen, linen workshop to which she was posted, commenting on her periodic illnesses and fevers, her hunger, commenting on her especially close mentorship with her um, uh, mentor, Surtia, um, uh, a young woman uh, who, to whom she was very close, commenting on her elation at being able to see a dentist. And so she was clearly not writing with the goal of creating a comprehensive historical record of the, the Lodge Ghetto. She was simply writing as a teenage girl. And yet her adolescent perspective often creates insights that likely wouldn't have occurred to older or more quote unquote sophisticated uh, memoirists. A good example is her tendency to portray the ghetto itself as a kind of personified force, sort of a mysterious personage or being that acts upon residents in nefarious ways. And she did this as a way of coming to grips with the pain caused to her by others uh, within the ghetto. In discussing a particularly painful episode in which members of the family stole bread from each other, she noted, quote, oh God, if you can't trust people like that, then whom can you trust? Whom? Oh, trust, it's so ugly. God, such rotten tricks, it's disgusting, it's unbearable, but it's what the ghetto did. When she discusses the ups and downs of her relationship with friends, uh, she notes of the influence of the ghetto. To tell you the truth, the ghetto affects them. It affects me too. And clearly it doesn't do us any good uh, at all, uh, end quote. And uh, ultimately, as those and some other passages show, it was the ghetto as an unholy 
almost cosmic force that brought hunger, that broke the bonds of morality, that caused people, many of them, people who loved each other, to hurt each other so badly uh, in the ghetto. Um, and so this way of personifying the ghetto was in part a survival strategy, right? Um, but it was a deeply creative and deeply insightful one. Um, uh, coming closer to the end here, um, uh, one of the central aspects, as I mentioned before, of Rivka's um, diary is um, uh, her expression of, of faith and the extent to which it structured her life. She makes frequent comments. I won't read many. I'll just read a couple, such as, I love God so much, exclamation point. Um, she also notes that, quote, I can always and everywhere rely on God, although I have, uh, I have to help a little myself since nothing's going to happen by itself. Uh, but I do know that God will take care of me. Oh, it's good that I'm a Jewish girl, that I was taught to love God. I'm grateful for all of this, exclamation point. Thank you, God. In addition to the devout Orthodox upbringing she experienced within her family, Rivka was also fundamentally shaped, as I mentioned briefly earlier, by her contact with the Beis Yaakov uh, movement, uh, which was founded by uh, Sarah Shanira in 1917 and quickly swept through Jewish communities in interwar Poland and beyond, eventually reaching the United States. Um, Beis Yaakov represented a dynamic, almost revolutionary approach to the religious education of Orthodox girls designed to cultivate an intense sense of camaraderie, of common identity, uh, of spiritual uh, and religious devotion. And for Rivka, her experiences um, uh, in Beis Yaakov study groups, for example, in Lodz, uh, not only provided her with spiritual direction and purpose, but gave her much of the glue that bound her so closely to her friends, and particularly to her aforementioned mentor, uh, Surtzia. Um, so a detailed discussion of Beis Yaakov would um, go well beyond the bounds of this, uh, of this lecture, but I do want to acknowledge um, Figa Weiss of the HMC um, uh, Library and Archive, um, who engaged me uh, a few weeks ago in an absolutely fascinating conversation about Beis Yaakov and its, uh, and its importance. And um, uh, she also recommended some, uh, some further reading. And so uh, for anyone who's interested, the best overview in English of Beis Yaakov is written by uh, Naomi Seidman, uh, who herself attended Beis Yaakov schools in, um, in New York. Um, and it's entitled uh, uh, Sarah Shanira and the Beis Yaakov Movement, A Revolution in the Name of Tradition, published by Liverpool University Press in 2019. Um, uh, that is a, a, a really interesting um, uh, uh, account of an extremely interesting and for Rivka, very important uh, movement. So I'm going to close um, uh, by discussing uh, Rivka's uh, hope for the future. We know that children can oftentimes exhibit an almost irrepressible sense of optimism and idealism unfettered by uh, the constraints of reality. Um, and to be sure, Rivka entertained thoughts of dying. We can see this attested to in many of the passages inside the diary. But in the end, she was unable to squash or, her, or, or abandon uh, her powerful inclination uh, toward hope. And so on, on April 11th of 1944, in the next to last entry of the diary, before the diary breaks off, uh, Rivka reflects on the coming of spring, spring weather following a brutal winter, uh, as a kind of metaphor for hope. She says, quote, thank you, God, for the spring. Thank you for this mood. I don't want to write much about it because I don't want to mess it up. But I'll write one very significant word, hope. I am so happy. Maybe it'll be better. Maybe finally it'll be all right. Oh, as soon as possible. Oh, this excitement. It seems to be overcoming everyone. In a way, it's because of this wonderful change in the weather. Yes, no doubt about it, end quote. Um, and that hope was not merely hope for her own personal survival. Ultimately, Rivka wanted desperately to change the world around her, uh, including the world beyond the walls of the ghetto, um, despite feeling utterly powerless most of the time. And in one of her most eloquent reflections, she attempted to balance between the hope for the future of, of, of humanity um, and the hopelessness uh, of her present situation. Quote, at this moment, I'd like to do so much for the world. I see so many, many defects, and I feel sorry that I can't find a place for myself. And when I realize that I don't matter in the world, that I'm just a speck of dust, that I can't do anything, at this moment, I feel much worse. I'm suffocating and I'm helpless. But importantly, she doesn't stop her reflection there. Instead, she continues, quote, 
The only thing that's encouraging me is the hope that it won't always be like this and that I'm still young. Maybe I'll grow up to be somebody and then I'll be able to do something. And it's on this note, Rivka's hope for the future, that I'll conclude. Rivka's personal fate after the Holocaust is uncertain. We have no confirmation of whether she quote unquote grew up to be somebody, whether she even had the chance to grow up at all. But her diary as a tangible object offers her a measure of earthly immortality and a platform through which she can indeed influence the world, the world around us. Most importantly, the fact that we're here this evening discussing her life, her words, her ideas, the fact that we're learning from and being inspired by her, the teenager who often felt so insignificant and powerless, is perhaps the best indication that her hope was not entirely misguided after all. Thank you. Is there, I, I just want to take a second. I'm going to take some questions from the audience. Um, that was an incredibly powerful talk, but I just want to recognize the team that's made the production work here. Um, Sarah Saltzman and I talked about having a back to uh, in-person event. Um, there are over 160 uh, devices that are watching this on Zoom as well. And um, the event that you're watching in person is being uh, simulcast uh, into the ether um, by uh, Kevin, Leo, Isaac, and Liz. And I just want to thank them for really putting together a great production. I've been peeking at it through my uh, device here to make sure that I was watching the questions as they were coming up. So I had a chance to sort of see the production. And I just want to thank everybody who's joining us by Zoom, as well as those of you who are here in the room. Um, OK, so I'd like to get some questions from the audience. Uh, those of you auditorium, if you'll raise your hands, we'll have a few people come through with microphones and um, they'll come over to you and hold the mic for a question. Bert has a question here in the front. Um, those of you who are on Zoom, uh, if you press the Q&A button um, in Zoom, you can post your question there and I'll be able to read it off um, to you as well. I'm very curious as to what happened to the commander. I noticed he was only about 45 years old when he died in 47. Did the Red Army or did the Russians uh, try him as 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 we did uh, in the west in the western zone. Is that the end? His end? Yes. So he was. If you can hear me, he was he was captured um, and placed on trial in Poland, somewhat similar to the case of Rudolf Hirsch, uh, who had been the commandant of Auschwitz, uh, who was then executed on the grounds uh, of Auschwitz. Um, uh, Hans Bibo was executed in uh, in Lodz in 1947. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bert. Um, question from the from Zoom. Um, what was the original population of the Lodz ghetto, Derek? Um, you said there were about 175,000 Jews in Lodz before. Yeah, it, it, so it fluctuated. Um, so the population, as I mentioned, of, of the Jewish, um, uh, the Jewish population of, 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 of Lodz uh, in, in 1939 was about 230,000. But because of out-migration, by the time the ghetto was sealed, it was approximately 175,000. Um, it swelled a little bit because of its use as a kind of um, uh, gathering point uh, regionally, um, uh, but then, of course, was was gradually um, uh, whittled down uh, uh, through deportation, through um, death from starvation or disease um, as well. So it's difficult in, to go by, you know, month by month to to try to figure out what the uh, what the population would have been. But 175,000 is the generally accepted number uh, at the outset. Yeah. I'm back here. Go ahead. As the uh... Soviets moved west and captured Poland. Did many Polish Jews in the ghetto survive or were they already liquid, liquidated to the death camps? Um, unfortunately, uh, most did not survive. Um, there were a few escapes. Um, the number of, of Jews that survived from, uh, from Lodz um, is, is tiny, um, uh, uh, possibly under 100. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to, to say um, uh, with, with certainty uh, here, um, but, but when we're speaking of, of, of Lodz, we're speaking of the, the ghetto that lasted the longest before, um, uh, before um, liquidation. Now, in certain cases, earlier liquidation did not necessarily mean earlier death. And so some uh, were transfor transported from other ghettos to places like Auschwitz, where they worked 
um, uh, uh, in the labor camp uh, uh, component of Auschwitz and had some uh, uh, prospect potentially uh, of survival rather than meeting uh, almost sure immediate death upon, upon deportation. But the numbers are, are, are obviously very discouraging. There's some, some questions here about how the diary was found. Um, I encourage you to read the introduction to the diary and to what, look at the exhibit that, that goes into that. So I'm not gonna take um, time here to discuss those. Um, but there is a question here, um, as long as that drama club was open. Um, so there was, it was a textile city. Did they make costumes? I would imagine they did. Uh, I wasn't able to find a, a, a tremendous amount on the, the, uh, the theatrical club. Um, I made it sound like I knew a whole lot because I did find that there were 85 performances over a two year period, which sounds like there must be a tremendous amount of documentation to know exactly how many number of performances there were. Um, we don't have that much uh, 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 detail or texture we use that term uh, about about the uh, the nature of the theatrical club, but I would not be surprised if they uh, manufactured their own costumes. That would seem that would seem fitting, absolutely. Um, another question here. Um, I, I just want to ask one of my own. Sure. Um, well, actually, after this question, perhaps do you want to talk a bit about the Soviet stall outside of Lodz and whether that might have been intentional? Is there any? Um, that may take us a bit further afield okay. than my expertise will stretch, uh, <laughs> okay. other than, uh, uh, but, but I'm, that is, that is certainly a topic. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, historians like Yehuda Bauer and others have really written quite a bit about what exactly happened in the summer of 1944, what was feasible, how far could, could Lodge have been, have been, have been liberated, or was there a desire to do so or a deliberate desire to leave it hanging? Memories of the Warsaw Uprising and so forth, but um, um, that would stretch a bit further than than maybe I want to go tonight. Go ahead. Okay. So, what ultimately changed in the Nazi regime between the decision to keep the Jews in the ghettos and the decision to just kill them with how they liquidated the ghettos? So, basically, there are a number of different ways of coming at this really um, important question. Um, the approach to explaining the Holocaust that probably focuses on this the most is called the functionalist approach, which holds that um, anti-Semitic hatred was not unimportant, but alone was not sufficient to understand how things actually unfolded on the ground. And so what really happened was the way that the Nazi decision-making hierarchy functioned, hence the functionalist approach, um, uh, was that various competing factions within the Nazi hierarchy, ambitious bureaucrats trying to build their own little empires within the Nazi system competed with each other in turf battles to try to expand their influence. And it turns out when you're dealing with something like the redevelopment of Poland, occupied Poland under, under German control, if you wanna outflank your, your rivals, ultimately it probably is, is, makes most sense for you to just run to the end point anyway, rather than gradually winding up at an exterminationist position. And so ultimately, um, one of the things that radicalized Nazi policy toward the Jews was this jostling, this kind of bureaucratic infighting that we see in the, in the Nazi regime. Um, it also had to do with uh, quite a bit with the military fortunes of the war. And so we have from the perspective of, let's say the summer and early fall of 1941, a tremendous amount of euphoria on the part of the Nazi planners because the invasion of the Soviet Union was going so well. The plan was we'll reach Moscow before the winter sets in, we'll force Russia out of the war, then we'll deal with the Jewish issue at that point. And of course the, the uh, advance toward Moscow slowed, the Germans never reached Moscow. They had to ride out the winter of 1941 and 1942. And it's right in that period when, even though we don't have a, a distinct written order from Hitler, a kind of smoking gun document that says we're gonna shift from um, uh, ghettoization, forced deportation, mass shootings to industrialized mass death in these death factories uh, in the East. We don't have that kind of a document, but it's right in that period, late 1941, when um, uh, clearly the plans were laid for physical extermination rather than piecemeal smaller solutions, that kind of final solution that we recognize. So we, we know effectively by January of 1942, because we have the minutes of the thing called the Vanze Conference, that the decision was no longer kind of being debated. What should we do uh, with the Jews? Should we try to send them to Madagascar? Should we try to send them to Siberia? The decision had been made for physical extermination. And then it was a matter of planning and, and a matter of time. Thank you. 
Um, I want to thank you, Derek, for a really interesting talk and the background. And I, I really um, encourage everyone to spend some time in the exhibit and, and to learn Rivka's story and to understand a bit of, of the experience of, of uh, Budger's Jews through one woman's, young woman's story. So, so, so thank you so much. I want to, again, thank um, Dr. Peskovitz and, and Oakland University for um, hosting um, such a, a great uh, a program here tonight. And again, sis, uh, Ms. L for um, her vision in creating the center here. Um, and uh, I, I just encourage everybody to, uh, to visit our, our, our museum shop and buy a copy of the, of the diary to read as, as uh, Dr. Hastings was referring to. Um, I wanna thank our, our members and our donors, everybody watching this evening. We, we truly appreciate everything you've done in the past year to support us through this, this very difficult time. And in general, that you show your support to the Holocaust Memorial Center. And this year will mark the 80th anniversary of the Babi Yar massacre. And over the course of 48 hours, beginning on the evening of September 29th, 1942, uh, um, 41, the approximately 34,000 Jews were forcibly rounded up and shot at Babi Yar in a ravine located near what is now the Ukrainian capital of Kiev. That horrific massacre became a symbol of the Holocaust by bullets that Derek was just discussing. And then this mass shootings carried out in Eastern Europe by the Nazis and their collaborators. To observe that anniversary, the HMC is going to rebroadcast a concert of a piece by Shostakovich, Babiar, remembering the Holocaust that was performed by the MSU Symphony Orchestra. The concert is going to be available to watch on our website from September 23rd through September 27th. And then on uh, Sunday, October 3rd, uh, Zlata uh, Filipovich will be joining us from her home in Europe to share her heartbreaking story of growing up in Sarajevo during the Bosnian War. If you're familiar with the movie Freedom Writers, uh, Zlata's diary is one of the tools that the teacher Aaron Grinwell uses to encourage students to keep their own diaries. Again, for more information or to register for either of these two programs, please visit the website holocaustcenter.org. Um, I thank you all for joining us. And I wish you all a good evening. Thank you.